Hi, everyone. Eric Johnson here, uh, your host for Log Tech Live, as usual. Um, I feel like Elton John here because I'm somehow still standing. Well, I'm sitting right now, but I'm still like awake and uh, able to do the show this week. As many of you may know, we just wrapped up uh, a super he hectic but super fun week in Long Beach, California um, at TPM and TPM Tech over the past seven, eight days. And uh, oh, sorry. sorry, sometimes I forget to turn the browser tab off on my on my own computer. Apologies for that. Um, it's really weird to hear yourself talking back to yourself. Um, in any case, I'm super delighted to be here now that I've got my own technical uh, issues um, sorted out. We have a fantastic show for you this week. Um, a really fun show, especially for those of you who are able to attend TPM Tech. Uh, a week ago, we have three of the panelists who were actually on one of the sessions, one of my favorite sessions, three of my very favorite people in the whole industry, who I'll be um, bringing on in just a few minutes um, to discuss all the stuff we didn't get to during our session at TPM Tech. Um, and they're going to give us some thoughts about what they took away from the from the conference. So um, just an amazing show. Like I have so much information in my head. You can probably hear my throat is um, tired of talking. I think I lost my voice at some point during the show, just so many conversations. Uh, it was great to be back uh, with, with the whole industry. Um, we had record attendance at TPM this year. It was nuts. Uh, it was raining the whole week in Long Beach too, so everyone had to be crowded into the convention center and the Hyatt right next door. So we had no choice but to just talk to a million people. It was, it was super fun. Um, so uh, TPM Tech was also great, and I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it because we will be talking about it with our guests, um, but really interesting. I think some of the things for me that were interesting, specifically interesting, were a lot of discussion about data quality, a lot of discussion about automation and what that means um, for the industry going forward, where we are now and where it is going, um, and uh, a lot of talk relevant to our guests who are about to come on. Uh, about how forwarders are dealing with this sort of barrage of technology that's available to them. Um, so a uh, few things before I jump into news of the week. Uh, I mentioned this on last week's show. We are, we just put one event to bed. The JOC team has another one right in front of us in New Orleans in April, uh, the uh, Break Bulk and Project Cargo Conference. Um, it's not as big as TPM, obviously, but it is huge within that industry. And I'll be leading a couple sessions on technology and the energy transition and what that means um, to that industry. There's a, a, a code if, to register for that event that's scrolling below you, 25% off for that if you uh, want to join us in New Orleans. Uh, that one is always a super fun event as well. Um, it's hard to beat New Orleans for a, a conference place, a uh, super fun um, place to uh, gather. Uh, newsletter. I know I, I messaged last week or the week before that it's been a very long time since I've written anything on my newsletter. I promised everyone I'm coming back next week. With TPM, uh, it was just impossible. There's just only so many hours in the day. I could have written a newsletter at like 10 a.m. or 10 p.m. on a Friday or a Thursday night, but then I would have really gotten the side eye from my wife. So I just decided a little bit of a hiatus. I will be back March 10th next week. Um, with a really cool one about um, cybersecurity, actually. So uh, it's a guest commentary uh, this week. So I'm still outsourcing, even even though I haven't even done one in so long. But it, it will be a good one, and uh, I'll be back with the regularly scheduled program uh, very soon. So you just have to wait one more week. Um, so let's get into the news of the week really briefly. There's a lot of news that happened um, even prior to TPM. Uh, so probably biggest or... I guess most gossipy news, <laughs> depending on how you look at it. Um, Slink, most famous for having a founder who has allegedly used a lot of the money that was invested into the company to um, have some fun, I guess is probably the best way to put it. Um, I, you know, we mentioned last week or on the last uh, episode of the show that uh, he had been uh, charged with both the SEC and DOJ for doing that. Well, Slink's investors, in the meantime, have uh, reinvested into the company, believing that there is still something there and that the new leadership, which is, of course, led by 
GT Nexus uh, vet, uh, John Urban, can actually make something of this company. They were at TPM. Their booth was going crazy. So, um, you know, it's interesting how a change of leadership can, can maybe change the uh, the sentiment around what a, a, a technology provider do or any service provider can do. So very will be very interesting to watch um, that and whether they end up being kind of the comeback story for this year. Um, Another piece uh, that I reported on uh, last week before TPM Tech, Sony uh, and uh, ONE, Ocean Network Express, um, announced that Sony was going to be uh, basically equipping all of ONE's dry boxes with sensors over an undetermined amount of time. But the reason it's interesting is, is that this, that's the second carrier to make such a commitment in the last year, Hapag Lloyd, which we've talked about on this show did the same last year in April. Um, so now we have two carriers. We had a discussion at TPM Tech about this. We had a discussion about data quality at TPM that centered around what the, the impact that smart containers might have on uh, providing better data to shippers and forwarders. I don't think this is going to be the last comp uh, announcement like this to be made. And in fact, got some got some sort of hints uh, on site at, in Long Beach last week that this may start to snowball, right? You don't want to be the carrier that's left behind with the only fleet of boxes that doesn't have uh, sensors on them. Um, so next story, also interesting, uh, GSBN, who spoke at both TPM Tech and TPM on different issues, um, announced right before the show that, or uh, maybe on the opening day of, of TPM Tech, I sort of lost track of the days, um, but they announced that they are partnering with uh, Navis or the, the parent company of Navis, the uh, famous terminal operating system provider, basically to connect um, terminal data uh, on a new app that the GSBN is uh, putting out there to help exporters manage ERD, which I think we've talked about on this show. I've certainly written a lot about it. We had a session at TPM Tech about ERD and, and the role technology can play. And this that was even before this announcement came out. Um, ERD was definitely a topic at TPM as well. And both uh, we had a shipper briefing with exporters and we had a, uh, a session um, that focused on exporter issues. ERD is probably the most difficult one that they deal with from a, at least from a data and operational standpoint. Um, we saw ERDs going crazy in terms of changes and amendments, really, really difficult to manage, results in a lot of extra truck trips, a lot of extra costs and inefficiency. So really interesting here, Navis has a ton of terminals that are running Navis software around the world, including uh, a decent number in North America. If they can pipe that information into uh, an app that exporters can use, and it's free for exporters to use um, to help keep track of those ERD changes, um, it should be interesting to see if that uh, makes a, a difference for them in terms of, of cutting down on those inefficiencies. Um, and then last but not least, uh, we, uh, you know, I spoke to uh, Flexport's now solo CEO, Dave Clark, famous for being kind of second in command at Amazon for many years. He took the reins in, in uh, September as co-CEO and, and, and took over just earlier this week as solo CEO. We had a great discussion. It was He was actually really more engaging than I was expecting uh, and pretty much no, no questions were off limits, uh, including some pretty crazy ones that came in on the, uh, on the uh, app that we use to incorporate um, feedback from the audience. Definitely encourage you to read the story that we posted about it. Um, he focused on kind of, uh, we, one of the things we focused on was sort of how their layoffs across the board, they laid off, I think around 20% of people in January, uh, but also announced that they're gonna be hiring a lot of tech talent. We talked about what those two sort of seemingly conflicting hiring streams mean. Uh, Dave's assertion was that there's because there have been so many layoffs in tech there's a lot of talent out there waiting to be snapped up and this was the time to sort of double down on that so but lots of other stuff um, to talk that we talked about so definitely um, read the recap of that and if you can get your hands on a recording of the session uh, definitely do that as well that's a perfect lead-in 
to bring my three guests in um, because all three of them are forwarders and I don't think any of them would identify themselves as digital forwarders. They're just forwarders, right? Who know and the importance of technology. And that's A, why I had them at TPM Tech and B, why we have them here because there's no way we could have covered all the ground we needed to in 30 minutes um, last week. So um, Farouk, Robert and Caitlin, uh, so delighted you could join us. Um, Robert is CEO of Freightright, based in Los Angeles. Caitlin is CEO of Global Gateway uh, Logistics in St. Louis, right? That's yep. right. right? Yep. <laughs> and Farouk is VP of uh, at Inner World Freight. You're based in Miami, right, Farouk? Yep. Yes. I think so. Okay, cool. Um, okay, I don't usually have three guests on uh, LogTech Live, so this is a new one for me, so I'm going to have to this is we're it's gonna it's gonna be a bit of a like uh f not a free-for-all but just grab a question whenever you want to uh, answer all oh. right so this this is going to be super free ranging we had a discussion called caught in the middle what forwarders actually want from technology and the reason uh, i wanted my three friends here to be on is because they are in this uh you not a unique situation but they are in this situation in the industry that other entities are not, which is they have to be constantly concerned with what they're using, what they're buying and how they, how they sell and provide that to their customers. Um, uh, so first I wanted to get your sense individually of what your sort of top takeaways from TPM tech were, um, aside from the panel that we, we did. Um, and then we can kind of talk about some of the things that we didn't get time to talk to, uh, on the panel. So Farouk, maybe you want to start us off? Sure, sure. Thank you, Eric, again, for hosting this, and it's a pleasure to be with you guys again. Um, so, main takeaways for uh, from TPM Tech. Unfortunately, I missed the, the almost the first day, um, but definitely two things. One, number one, was to validate that that finally, at one point, I believe the whole industry is consolidated and, and talking about same topics. So finally, we, we, we have seen that, yes, data quality is very important. You know, at the, at some years ago, two, three years ago, everyone was trying to, to hit the nail. Uh, and, uh, and, and this year, you know, uh, listening to some of the panels from the, you know, uh, all the, the top management from multinationals uh, uh, talking about what, what's important for them, mainly data quality. What caught my, my attention this time, which I thought was sort of new, was a lot of financial products around technology and shipping. Okay. That caught my attention. That was not something that I was seeing before. So now it's, uh, okay, they're bringing some tech-enabled financial products uh, to forwarders and BCOs. I'm, I thought that was interesting. I, I could see some use on that but you know between now and maybe a year or two let's see if uh, if uh, that's something that that will stick right so i think those are the two main things uh, my main thing. i agree there was tons to talk about finance and i felt i felt like i missed a beat a little bit in terms of not having a session or specifically around that we had a, a provider or two on, on <clears> session <throat> to, to deal in that space but you're right there was a lot of talk um yeah caitlin what, what was your kind of main takeaway yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with Farouk on the um, the financial side of the freight forwarding tech. Um, I'm I'm curious to kind of see what comes out of the woodworks this next year. Um, but I actually thought that the conversations around AI were really interesting. Um, I think we're starting to just break the surface um, to what forwarders really want in terms of AI, if you ask me. Um, but I actually think one of my favorite sessions was the session you hosted with LogNet and talking about um, how how can we really, you know, advance AI in this industry. And to me, you know, I think there's a lot of tech players right now in this industry that think they know what we need. Um, and so they're investing millions and millions of dollars into building this out. But the reality is we need something vastly different. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to think of like a good example to give you. And, and the best would be, you know, um, I always say to my staff, I'm like, 
every day you're going to have some sort of logistics issue. There's never a perfect day in logistics ever, right? So when are we going to get to a point with AI where it's not only going to alert you that there's an issue, but it's going to be able to fix that issue? Mm -hmm. And I think until we kind of get to that point, I'm not fully trustworthy that AI can solve for a lot of the things that a forwarder needs. Um, but it was really interesting to kind of see those conversations starting because three or four years ago, it was blockchain. And that was the big... Um, 2018, I remember. Yeah, and, and I still and actually... And all yeah, and I actually... <laughs> right, and I actually believe... Um, and, and maybe there's technology out there that I'm just unaware of, but I actually think, you know, utilizing many of these tools, as we've spoke about before, Eric, that, you know, you kind of have a, a main hub, but then you have all of these different tools that plug into it. Yeah. I could see um, with shipments that my team's dealt with this week, where blockchain would have been extremely useful in mitigated um, thousands of dollars in, in, you know, um, so, I mean, I definitely like that we're talking about AI. I would love to see a blend between AI and blockchain possibly in the next TPM tech and how those two trends could work together in log tech. I'm taking notes right now. Um, I'm glad you brought up that AI session with John Motley at Lognet. He had my favorite, my favorite, sorry, not, it didn't come from you, any of you three, but my favorite quote from the whole conference was he said, ultimately the best UI is no UI, right? I love that. Like, wh why should anyone even have to like go to a website to check what happened? It should just have resolved itself, right? So yeah. that's obviously the ideal <laughs> state, but I thought that was a really interesting, like, cause AI gets so theoretical and so difficult for someone who's not a technical person to actually like try to understand. That for me was the best kind of example of like, that's what we should be aiming toward um robert give me your give me your top takeaway from tech yeah i think uh definitely was uh very cool to see that uh, uh, i don't know my my takeaway is that everybody's biggest pain uh is uh is data quality and visibility because uh in the hallways too like when you talk to customers your bcos uh you know that's what everybody talks about is okay how do i get full visibility and and no nobody seems to have it right uh, uh, so so i think uh, there's definitely a consensus on uh what's the most needed uh solution and the the one that's just isn't there um it's interesting on the financial product side uh, you know how um it's it's very hard not to look at it as another um, sort of uh, fad because uh, you know, in 2021, 22, uh, a lot of this, uh, for example, trade finance companies were uh, basically getting into financing freight because you know freight was up there with the cost of goods, right? Yeah. Uh, we 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 had customers paying twenty thousand dollars to ship product worth thirty thousand dollars. So right. Right. Uh, right. it's it's you know a lot of these uh, companies uh, went into offering financing freight, and now that freight's Thirteen hundred dollars. Nobody cares anymore, right? And now, like a whole year of developing a product has gone to waste. Uh, just like a few years of developing uh, uh, blockchain-based solutions for logistics has gone to waste. So, it's it's. Uh, I think that that's another interesting takeaway from me is how careful you have to be as an investor, as a as a technology uh, provider, and as, as a software developer. That what may be a problem today that you hear from a lot of people may simply not exist or not even be relevant uh, two years from now. So it's, mm. it's just an interesting angle, I think, uh, for people to consider just because we're now, I think if we really thought about it, we can probably name six, seven different fads that happened in logistics. Yeah. And a lot of people invest in and build a lot of products around that, you, you know, you don't hear about them anymore. Mm. So true. The, the, you know, yeah. the visibility piece, my, my boss, Peter Tershwell, who was at Tech and and uh, kind of wrote a little recap on LinkedIn about it, saying he's sort of mesmerized by the fact that here it is 2023 and visibility is still seems to be pretty much the same problem that it was 15, 20 years ago, right? So um, yeah, I, I, there, there's definitely a story to come on that for me um, coming out of TPM and, and TPM Tech. Um, and 
the point about the applicability of a product in different markets is super interesting, right? I had I, I can remember having a, a furniture shipper tell me when when spot rates were going crazy last year. Um, it, it actually influenced what they were sending too, right? He said, I can't if it's a if it's a three thousand dollar if it's three thousand dollar sofas in the container, I can justify it. If it's because people are ordering them, that's why they come to our shop. If it's a bunch of like, you know, decorations that we hope people also buy when they come in the store, uh, but no one is like making a pre-order for, uh, you know, candlestick holders, right? We can't, and the freight is more than the cost of the goods inside the box. We can't justify that. So we hold that back. Right? And also, and also more expensive furniture, right? I think uh, we, we have furniture customers. We don't typically handle furniture customers as a company, but we have furniture customers who basically were not affected at all. Yeah. Even paying $20,000 a container because right. every, every chair they sell is $4,000, you right. know, right. but right. that's not, uh, that, that's not your typical furniture market. So definitely, uh, I, I, and I don't know if there's any research on that, but I'm sure in the last two years there there was a lot less um, cheaper furniture available in the United States than uh, than the luxury type. Yeah, it's it's hard to imagine a more kind of volatile sector uh, than home furnishings mm -hmm. the last few years, right? Um, we do a lot of it, by the way. So yeah, we, we've oh. seen, yeah. Um, and they've been hit hard. I mean, between tariffs and then inflated shipping costs, um, a lot of them pretty much either loss, took a huge loss in 2021 and 2022. Um, because what was interesting is you didn't, a lot of the times in different industries as well, you didn't see the inflation of shipping being passed on through the unit cost. Yeah. Yeah. because they still had to compete with with other furniture vendors um, to sell to retailers or hotels. So that's that's what was interesting to me is that a lot of the times they they ate the shipping inflation. Um, and we talked about it a little bit, but like agriculture, you know, they're half their margin, if not more than that, is in shipping. Interesting. Yeah, and, and, and everything starts even before we're talking about finished products. A, a dear friend of mine is uh, the major glycerin exporter from Brazil. And, um, you know, a, a container of glycerin is maybe $10,000 worth of product. So all of a sudden, the price per ton went up like $1,000, mm -hmm. right? So and then glycerin, if you look at around you, almost everything has glycerin in it. Yeah, right. food products, everything has glycerin. So it starts from the from the very beginning on raw materials, and it's just this circle that inflates, 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 inflates a product. And at the end of the day, well, that's what happened in the world in the last year. You know, everything is extremely expensive, and uh, you know, I, you know this. I think this circles around to something that we touched on in our panel, uh, but we didn't get anywhere near far enough. Is the idea of ROI, right? So you have to be able, you you three have to be able to justify any ROI or any, any investment you make into tech, whether it's your own or what, what you're buying through some sort of ROI metric, because um, you will have, you have to price freight and whatever services according to what you yourself have invested. And of course, what the market will bear, right? So how do you, how are you sort of thinking about that ROI question as you deal with all the vendors that you came across at TPM tech that are, pinging your email inboxes every single day versus what you know you can build internally. Robert, I, let's start with you. I know, or Farouk, sorry, you jumped in first. You get first. No, no, it's okay. Robert, you can take it. <laughs> I know yeah, this. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can, I can, I can share. Um, so after, after the TPM, I, I um, went to another conference. And before that, I was in another conference. And before that, I was in another one. <laughs> and uh, it was great meeting new, new people. Also, a lot of potential clients. In fact, I just landed uh, back today with a lot of opportunities on new customers, right? And to be honest with you guys, a platform technology came never into our discussion about uh, closing new opportunities, okay? Mm -hmm. So what the, the most important thing was to create a meaningful relationship with that person, agent, client, BCO, you name it, 
right? Create that, that link, that trust, yeah. where they say, you know what, Farouk, I want to do business with you. Now, of course, now I have to deliver, right? Now I have to perform and, and deliver a good service and um, the a service that will be contracted with the five or six carriers that are carrying all the volume around the world. So that makes me not a not unique, right? I'm going to book on the same vessels as Caitlin, Robert, and uh, everyone, right? Or on the same airplane. So um, that brings me back to, to your question. So ROI, and, and this is me, okay? So it helps to attract, uh, to get the attention of new of BCOs and, and agents, even agents. In my case, I do a lot of business with agents all around the world. Yep. But, but the technology part is never the what makes them take a decision on doing business with Farouk or not. This is my case. I would love to to hear from Robert and Caitlin, right? But this is at least this is my case now. But but I love technology and I use many different things in in my company, right? I, I've built my own ecosystem of the tools that I do really believe bring ROI to me, and all these are related to we spoke about it the internal efficiencies. Okay, because if I have a, a good looking dashboard that I know is going to cost me X cents per TU or per house bill of lading or whatever, okay, that's a fixed cost that I have there. It's a product there. Usually maybe 20, 25% of the customers will log in and actually check where the, where the container is. But, but, um, but I look more ROI on for example, being able to, to build dashboards and KPIs to really measure the performance of my team, right? right? To, to measure what trade lanes are more profitable, profitable to me, to, to have a segmentation of my customers and say, okay, I have customer type A, type B, type C. This one is not profitable enough, right? And so these type of uh, dashboards that talk to me in my language and, and, and allow me to make better decisions for my company. Um, not saying that that the products out, out there don't bring any value, but I just think that let's let's say for example visibility, right? It depends, it depends on the customer, on the product, on the trade lane, right? Uh, where visibility will add more value to you know to customer A versus customer B, right? Uh, you know, when I order on Amazon, I never log in on FedEx or UPS to see where my thing is, right, where my product is. I just know it should be here next week or, or tomorrow. And if it doesn't get here on time, then I log in and I check what's going on, right? But I don't want to be checking every every minute, every two minutes about where the container is, right, or, or, the, or, the, or the air freight shipment is. So that's that's my humble opinion on that. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know what you think, Robert. It's a great point, Farouk. And some, sometimes we lose sight of it, right? That, you know, sometimes, oftentimes the, the customer doesn't really even care what you have. It's, a, it's like they there's expectations, but they don't really care how you go about meeting those expectations, right? Exactly. So. I think that, that that will be like a ticket to play, right? You want to play the game? You need to have that ticket to to go and and play it, and and we're getting to a point where the cargo wise, the magayas, the, the all the all the systems will allow us to have a off the shelf solution uh, in terms of visibility and and customer experience and dashboards. So we're getting to the point where that's becoming standard, right? Okay. Is it, it was not the case five years ago. Five years ago, I believe the flex ports and all these digital forwarders got so much traction because they had something different at that moment but right now you know all, all the multinationals have that and i would say maybe 70 percent 60 percent of the independent forwarders around the world also have a system that that has a dashboard and you can quote online book online track online and pay online right i think this is this is our case it's just that it's not um unique anymore right? Maybe they have a better product, right? But at the end of the day, that will be a ticket to play. You have to have something like this to to, to be on the market, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Robert? I know the ROI yeah, is 
Kirill? Uh, my my experience is is uh, very different from Farouk's. Uh, actually, when I talk to new customers, technology is front and center. Now, maybe that's because I uh, I bring it up a lot. <laughs> so, like that's that's uh, that's my opening with the customer is what 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 technology are you getting from your forwarder? Because in um, at least in the markets we operate, when I go uh, and analyze customer supply chain, uh, the biggest gaps you can identify and the biggest savings you can identify are all riding on the back of technology. You know, the, we, we had customers, uh, we talked to customers that paid, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in conversations with at least five different customers right now who paid in excess of a million dollars in Demurigin uh, detention last year. Uh, now, we couldn't have saved them all of the million dollars, but we could save them maybe 40% of it had they had the right technology tracking their stuff, tracking which containers are dwelling longest, tracking which containers of the dwelling containers have higher per diem rates, right? I mean, they had visibility into none of this, and they were just downloading the container that was closest to the dock versus the one that's further up uh, in the yard but has tripled the amount of per diem you know, uh, basically accruing. Uh, and there's there's just so many places that technology comes into play. Now, ROI uh, on those is very different from ROI on some of these, uh, you know, like uh, off the shelf visibility providers, off the shelf uh, AP automation, and you know, the, this, this, this kind of products that are out there that, uh, you know, we get pinged every day uh, in our mailboxes, like you said, um, the, it's, it's, at first glance, it's very hard to figure out the ROI because, you know, if you read the emails that they send, it's, it's I mean, you know, they, I see things like, oh, uh, customer so-and-so, uh, his retention has gone up to whatever percentage or have closed, I don't know, 80% more business because they have this tool now. I'm like, okay, says who? You know, like, how do you even calculate that? Like, I, uh, we have more data than most forwarders out there because I'm obsessed with data. Even I can't figure that out. Like, how do you know that, you know, you booked this customer because of this visibility tool or of this product and not because of your sales pitch or not because of some other piece of technology that you're offering the customer? It's, it's extremely hard to figure that out. And, you know, to figure that out, like, you, first of all, you have to understand to, like, perfection the lifetime value of your accounts. I mean, lifetime value of your accounts across multiple segments. And then you have to figure out some kind of, uh, you know, average uh, closing rate of new business and then somehow factor out every specific type of technology that you're paying for and try to somehow understand which one is responsible for a percentage of new business or retention and then understand the ROI. Now, I, I'll just say 99% of the freight forwarders out there don't have the data to even be able to figure this out. They just This is just impossible. So if somebody's emailing you saying, oh, I have this product and it's going to give you this percent new business, I mean, it's nonsense, right? Uh, it really depends on the type of the customers you're talking to. It depends on what your customers are asking for. Uh, in Farouk's case, uh, his customers are looking for, uh, you know, it's relationship based, it's, it's, uh, it's service based. Uh, in, in, in my case, a lot of our customers, you, you know, they import, I don't know, there's a segment of our customers that has a massive issue with, uh, you know, coordinating uh, last leg because, you know, they, they have a lot of per diem and detention and demurrage issues for them. Uh, visibility is key and it saves them hundreds of thousands of dollars, but a very specific type of visibility, nothing off the shelf can handle that. You know, so to me, there are segments that I have no choice. I have to build because the just product isn't out there or the customer's solution needs to be bespoke, you know, where you just can't customize somebody else's product. So it's a, I think the ROI question is a very sophisticated one uh, and anybody who pretends to have an idea of <laughs> what the ROI is on some of these things. It's just it's misguided. And if you have, if you have to hire like three business analysts full time to help you understand that your margin is like, you can watch your margin go down. <laughs> okay. If you have to hire business analysts, just hire them and put them into operations. Let them you know, <laughs> move and watch shipments. Um, so Caitlin, um, 
we're running into the exact same problem that we ran into in our prep call and in our session. Like there's, I, I have like eight yeah. questions that I'm not even going to get to today. We're going to have to do this <laughs> in some other format and venue. Um, Kaylin, you went into some things that you felt were working and the things that were not working. Do you want to like kind of highlight some of those things that, you know, have worked for you? Cause you've done, yeah. I think you, you said to me, me and publicly on multiple occasions you've done as exhaustive a sort of study of what's right. out there as, as you can so like yeah working or not. yeah well and i i totally agree with both farouk and robert um on what they said on rois and um you know it kind of i'll be honest with you when i'm demoing these these different platforms in my mind i'm not even considering roi i'm considering is this going to solve a problem for my team internally or my customer. Um, and our vision statement at our company is um, to simplify global logistics through boutique service and technology. So we have to have those two elements um, effectively operating, you know, at its highest level for us to retain our customers. So um, in terms of what has worked for both of those, so um, we... I will say, I think that there is something to be said about the terminal management systems. Um, we actually licensed one. I think I mentioned at TPM Tech, we ended up canceling the license because the data was incorrect. Um, I was super excited about it. I thought, man, this is going to be awesome. We're going to be able to streamline um, effectively what our TMS system can't because our TMS system didn't have that capability to tell us when that container was available it had container tracking through api but it it was very spotty at at the at a minimum and so we needed to enhance it by adding in another layer of perfection but even that layer wasn't wasn't correct um so what we've kind of done is we've married up um marine marine um tracking which by the way, a lot of these um, vessel tracking uh, GPS systems, they're free. We tell our customers too, you guys can sign up for an account with Marine Traffic or Fleetmon um, and you don't have to pay anything. You might pay more to get extreme visibility, but for basic visibility, um, you know, here's where we're pulling our data from. And so to me, I think that at the end of the day, any sort of GPS locating, um, technology is going to be an investment that's worthy um, because I, I do believe that it's better than what a steamship line is going to provide in terms of data. You're beholden to what, you know, probably overseas um, tracking centers for steamship lines are putting in and when they're putting it in. So, I mean, those have worked really well for us. Um, but I mean, on its face, like I, I actually do think the customer, the digital customer portal, um, those are really, really, really important. And I would argue that I think a lot of forwarders at least need to have some sort of solution to that. Um, a lot of our clients, they range from super small importers and exporters to extremely large, um, complex global supply chains in, in tons of different countries. And typically what we find is that the, the smaller importer exporter has the same need for visibility that the larger ones do. And so um, we are forever going to continue to push our, um, our client dashboard provider to perfect things. Um, I can tell you five things off the bat that I emailed them today and, or yesterday and said, you need to perfect this. My customer's demanding it. We're demanding it. Um, and so I think it's going to take forwarders really being a part of this conversation and pushing their tech providers further and not just settling for what exists. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely say um, what's tough is, and I hope it's okay if I, if I call out some good, good um, examples of, sure, of tech. Definitely. but um, I actually think companies like hash move and go freight, that's where they excel. They have some really cutting edge, customer facing dashboards. And I'm like, I, they, they sell me on the demo. I'm like, this is awesome. I love this. This works way better than what I have. But then you go a step further and you start really talking to, you know, a sales rep or an integration representative. 
And then you realize, well, I would have, you don't have the back end data that I need that Robert was talking about, all of the data that kind of runs what we do in our KPIs. They're not sophisticated enough yet with their systems to hold that type of data, to mm -hmm. store it, to theorize it, to quantify it. So at the end of the day, you're still stuck with the TMS system you've had that isn't great. But then what I also realized too, is I'm like, okay, well, can I keep my backend and then integrate with, let's say, Go Freight for a user dashboard? It is extremely complicated. Um, and every sales rep, and probably Robert and Farouk can agree, every sales rep for a technology will tell you, oh yeah, we have, we have API, EDI, tons of integration, no problem. But once you get into mentally the thick of it, everything to you, so. yeah, once you get into the thick of it and you get to those really super detailed integrations, they just can't do it. And so we did get pretty far with a couple, um, a couple players in that in that realm. And then ultimately, I'm like, there, it's not going to work, guys. Like you're pushing, you know, a square into a circle. It's not, it's not feasible at this point. Um, and I think that's that's why you're seeing a lot of M and A activity right now um, with TMS solutions, like with the enterprise software solutions, like a Magaya or CargoWise. Buying I up think, lots of yeah, buying yeah. Up. They're they're realizing okay, our customers are going elsewhere to find this solution, so we need to acquire these solutions and try to build them in. But even that process is not seamless, and we're going through it right now. And it's kind of a nightmare. It's been um, it's been a lot, probably about six months worth of an implementation. Yep. I knew this was going to happen. I've, I've only asked you guys like two or three questions, and we're already like out of time. Um, okay, I have two final questions. One is the fun one I always do at the end of every episode. But first, you have thirty seconds each to give me the trickiest problem you face right now, and one that you wish like forget the cost like if you could solve it tomorrow yourself or with a provider what would it be loaded question for 30 seconds you just need to say what it is so the vendors out there can actually work on it hear it straight from the source boys go ahead <laughs> <laughs> robert you unmuted come on Man, you uh, that, that that that's a that's a tough question indeed. Uh, in thirty seconds, uh, I think um, uh, you know what I would like to uh, see addressed a lot, which is you know sort of un underlies a lot of the things we talked about is, is uh, standardization of data. Mm. And the shipment, uh, a, a basic door-to-door -door shipment, has something like in our system something like seven hundred fifty data points. And uh, you know, we don't even agree as an industry what those data, what what the data standard should be. And I think that would uh, be the platform, uh, you know, that that would underlie any platform that could centralize things, that could uh, allow for more collaboration between different parties. Uh, some of the problems Caitlin just described uh, would go away, where you want to use one solution for a backend, one solution for a front end, another solution for KPI. Uh, you know, measurements, uh, if the data is structured the same way, uh, it would make uh, it would make everything else a lot more easier. So that we, that's, I think it's a massive so at, thing. To... At TPM Tech, we had something called the DevCon, which we started this year. And the thing that we made the most progress on, or apparently everyone made the most progress on, was on that topic. And so hopefully a group, the group that worked on that will push that forward over the next year. And so we can actually like say a year from now, when we meet again, that, that, that there'll be some actual progress. So um, right, I got to join that group. Yeah. Yeah. It was, I th it, from what I heard, it was small, but really, really, really solid in terms of, of that particular topic. So I see, I saw both of you nodding and, and I think Robert spoke for about like a minute and 15 seconds. So he took up. Most of the time, so Thanks, Robert. I can <laughs> say, I can only say very quick because I maybe 90% of my business is the export related. Yep. I would think uh, ERD is something yep. that keeps me up at night. Yep. And, uh, yep. so, and I, so I'm, I'm so sorry I missed that panel, but I would love to to know what what it's been done there because that's a for me that's a big big pain right now. Well, we can we can talk offline about all the stuff that's going on in that space because there is some cool stuff. Um, yeah. 
Okay. Now you have my favorite part of the show. You all have to tell me who your favorite ever band or musician is. And I know Farouk is, uh, obviously you can see his background. Um, he's not only a, a connoisseur of music, but he's a musician himself. So Farouk, you start us off. My answer is not going to be a straight or maybe it's going to be boring. You know, being a musician, I really love every kind of music and I have yeah. so many different favorite bands yeah. and, and, and musicians and, and genres, you know, uh, I love listening to Brazilian music. I think Brazilian music is combines harmony and melodies and rhythms like no other uh, music. Um, it's it's too difficult to say. Uh, I love to uh, I love listening to a uh, to an a South African a cappella group uh, called Lady Smith Black Mambaso. It's not it's not Amazing. commercial. Maybe you've heard uh, them. Uh, Paul Simon uses them a lot uh, in, in many of his recordings. But, uh, you know, you get me started now. And I know. Uh, I know. We'll like, like need four hours. minutes. Just a lot like of that. Latin music. I love Sting. I love uh, rock music, jazz, of course. That's what I studied. And But, yeah, okay. I mean, I cannot say one. <laughs> All right. Caitlin? Okay. Um, as we said, I, I love, I have a favorite band for every genre. Um, but the one that if I'm just having a rough day in global logistics that I blare up on the way home and just scream it out is taking back Sunday. Oh, nice. All right. Band. I know that group. Yeah. I know that group. Well, cool. That's a good one. That's a good one to scream. Yeah. Scream in totally. the car by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, Robert. Well, I, you know, like uh, like everybody else, I have a ton of uh, favorites, but, uh, you know, I don't know a lot of musicians. I know uh, one very well, which is uh, Farouk. So I'm, I'm going to go with uh, Farouk being my favorite musician because he's one of the few that I know personally as a human being. And, and I'm sure if we get to know a lot of our favorite musicians as human beings, they will like them. We are. <laughs> there you go. Like so, 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 so Farouk is Thank my you, best Robert. bet. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> Amazing. All right. Thank you. Cool. Well, we'll we'll include Farouk on the new uh, on the uh, eventual Log Tech Live um, Spotify list. So, listen. <laughs> thank you so much. I know you've all been traveling like crazy, especially you, Farouk. I truly appreciate you both, all all three of you being at, at TPM Tech, but also here today. Um, and I'm sure our audience uh, really appreciates it as well. So we'll see you soon. Okay. Talk to you all later. And have a great 23. Bye bye. All right, sorry, we're running a little bit late this week. Uh, just had too much to talk about. Um, so before we wrap up, uh, I, well, dad joke. How could I forget the dad joke of the week? Um, what do you call a factory that makes okay products? A satisfactory. Is that okay? That's pretty good. Hopefully, hopefully TPM Tech was more than satisfactory. Um, it, it seemed like it was. Most people seemed to have a good time there last week. So um, before we wrap up, I wanted to once again make a call out that everyone needs to be making a donation to the blended pledge. Um, please donate individually, but what would be even better is if someone out there could get their company to own this particular topic. Um, it's all about making sure that there's diverse voices on stage at logistics events, supply chain events, uh, it, the, the, Blended group uh, initiative is about giving people budget to travel when they don't necessarily have the budget, whether they get invited to speak or whether they just need to attend and and uh, and you know be present at these industry events that have typically not been as diverse as they could be. Um, so definitely, uh, please donate. the The GoFundMe has about only about forty percent of their of what they're trying to achieve. Some company out there should just like double what they're trying to achieve and be front and center and own this topic. I keep challenging the industry to be that company. Um, so there you go. Uh, great episode. Uh, hopefully you all enjoyed it. I'll be back in two weeks with another really interesting guest who's not necessarily in the logistics industry, but has been observing it and has some thoughts. Um, so we will be back in two weeks. Have a great rest of your Friday, everyone. And thank you so much, as always, to Nicole, our show producer, Let's Talk Supply Chain, and Sarah and the whole um, Let's Talk Supply Chain team. But most of all, thank you to you for tuning in. Have a great Friday and a great weekend. Bye, everyone.